Hey everyone, this is Dan. Let's talk about Qualcomm. Should we buy or sell Qualcomm stock? Let me explain more. We have a lot to cover. First of all, I will talk about the trend of the Qualcomm stock in the last 12 months. And then I will share with you some important news that happened in the last two, three months that might have affected the stock price. I'll then dig deeper into the charts, applying technical analysis. And then I will show you my own valuation of the company. We'll look at the other analysts' opinions, and then we will dig into patents and lawsuits. And finally, I will talk about the industry landscape and look at the competitive advantages and disadvantages of Qualcomm. This is how the price has been trending in the last 12 months. As of this past Friday, Qualcomm closed at $144.94, and it came down a little bit from the all-time height of 167.94 about 12% decrease. But if you look at the beginning of the year compared to market close last Friday, there has been an increase of 64% in the last 12 months, which is certainly very impressive. If you look at the absolute bottom from the absolute all-time high, there has been an increase of more than 100%. In other words, if you had been able to time the market perfectly, you would have reaped the profit of more than 100%. Are there more opportunities in the future? We'll talk about it. Actually, I started to look at Qualcomm with the intention of spending only about 30 minutes to make a key decision for myself. And the reason was that I bought two batches of Qualcomm. First, I bought a few shares back in May 20th of 2020. And then I bought a second batch on November 30th of 2020. Overall, my holdings have been up 33.4%, which is pretty impressive. Then I sold off some shares in the beginning of December. I'll talk about it as to why I sold. But my remaining shares still average an increase of 33.4% from the basis. Originally, I wanted to spend 30 minutes looking at Qualcomm to decide whether I will sell off the rest of the shares in the next few days because it dropped about 11-12% from the all-time high. And if you look at this chart, it seems to be on a decline, looking bearish. So my 30-minute study turned out to be a four-day study as I dig deeper and deeper into the patents and lawsuits and the different processors for cell phones and how Qualcomm compared to Samsung and Apple and so on and so forth. And eventually, I came to a very surprising conclusion. In the next few minutes, I will share with you some of the details. Let's look at some of the more important news that happened in the last few months that might have affected the price of Qualcomm. In chronological order, back in December 10 of 2020, Apple announced that they had started to work on their own cell phone modem so that they would not be relying on buying modems from Qualcomm a few years from now. And then on December 25th, well, Christmas Day 2020, this particular internet article reported that the company MediaTek, which is based in Taiwan, surpassed Qualcomm to become the biggest smartphone chipset vendor in the third quarter of 2020. MediaTek's market share increased to 31%, whereas Qualcomm's market share decreased from 31% to 29%. The good news is that Qualcomm still has 39% market share for the 5G chipset market. That means Qualcomm is a formidable player in the 5G segment, which is the newest segment for cell phones, as you know. And then on January 5th, 2021, the news came out that the longtime CEO at Qualcomm will step down and the new CEO will be someone from inside of Qualcomm who has many years of experience with the company. On January 21st, the CNBC report came out saying that Qualcomm's chip market share plunged in China after the Huawei sanctions imposed by the Trump administration. And because of it, MediaTek has taken number one spot in the cell phone chipset market, as we already mentioned previously. And then on January 26, Qualcomm announced their new initiatives into the automotive segment. On February 3rd, Qualcomm announced their quarterly earnings. Their revenues missed the consensus estimates by just a little bit, but the sales were up 63% year over year. And the earnings 
increased 119% year over year. Overall, that was a very impressive performance. Nevertheless, because the revenue supposedly came under the expectation just by a little bit, the stock price plunged. Then we'll look at the chart later. And then the following day, Citibank downgraded Qualcomm from buy to neutral and revised the price target from 194 down to 165. Notice that 165 is still higher than the current price of 144.9. That's why I'm still bullish about Qualcomm from the current price level. And then on February 15, Fortune magazine as well as some other major media reported that there had been a chip shortage in 2021, which is still going on. And Qualcomm to some extent is also impacted by this chip shortage because Qualcomm relies on Samsung and Taiwan Semiconductor for building its processors. Qualcomm doesn't have its own foundries. Let's see how the news items that we discussed impacted the price. First of all, they had a quarterly earnings announcement back in November, which was very positive, and the stock price jumped up on the day of the announcement. And then when Apple announced that they were going to build their own modems, the stock price dropped on that day because of the news. Actually, there shouldn't be any surprise to people because Apple bought the modem division from Intel back in 2019. We'll talk about that later. And then when Qualcomm announced that they were pushing into the automotive segment to supply processors for the car industry, the stock price actually dropped. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe some investors felt that Qualcomm was really losing steam in the cell phone market. That's why they're trying to find other sources of revenues. Actually, that's not true based on what I found in the last few days. Qualcomm has been getting stronger than ever in terms of making chipsets for cell phones. And I'll talk more about that later on. And then right after Qualcomm announced the latest quarterly earnings, the price dropped by nearly 10%. And then the following day, it was hit by the downgrade. Let's look at this daily chart again. As you can see, we had a nice upward trend from the beginning of December to the beginning of February. And then after the earnings report, it dropped and started to assume this slightly downward trend. In the meanwhile, my price target is actually at $160 to $180 a share by the end of 2021, which is higher than where we are today, which is 144.9. I will explain why I set that target. In this hourly chart, we see a bearish signal from DMI on February 4th and then on the same day, we also saw this bearish signal from MACD. So why do I set my target to be so high in spite of all these bearish signs? Let's continue. I see this major historical price level right at about 145. This will either act as a support or resistance. If the stock price goes below that line, the next support levels will be 130 and 122. Nevertheless, I'm bullish about Qualcomm. Let's go on to the next chart. If you look at the hourly chart, the picture actually is rather bullish. First of all, we had an all-time high of 167, which is a good 11, 12% from our current level. That means if the price recovers to the all-time high, we can see a potential gain of 11, 12%. In the meanwhile, in the last two days from this hourly chart, we see a channel that's slowly trending upward. That's kind of bullish. We had this buy signal from MACD this past Thursday, confirmed by a bullish buy signal from DMI early Friday. So things are looking a little bit up. It is important at this point to see whether the price will break through the resistance level of 145, as we mentioned in the previous slide. And then if it can go above this level, 145, the next barrier to penetrate will be 147.5, and then the next one will be 149.5. In fact, if the price goes above 145, Monday or Tuesday, I'll most likely buy more shares. Before we continue, I'd like to say that I will very, very much appreciate if you can click the like, subscribe, and notification button. That's for the sake of the YouTube algorithm. Let's continue. We'll look at some of the fundamental data for Qualcomm. The company has a market cap of about $164 billion. Certainly, it's a very big company. Its annual revenues have been about $22 to $24 billion a year. 
They have healthy free cash flow of about $3.9 billion. Debt to equity ratio is a little bit on the high side. It's 213%. One of the reasons why the debt ratio is so high is that because they recently had to fend off a hostile takeover from Broadcom, and they make quite a few financial moves in relation to that. Jacking up a debt to equity ratio is usually a very typical defense against any unwanted suitors in the corporate world. And I'm not particularly concerned about that because they have very good incomes and very good cash flow. And besides, interest rates are very low nowadays. They have a dividend yield of 1.8%, and the 12-month net earnings increase is 18.5%, with a one-year period ending September 30th, 2020. After that, the earnings increase has been even more impressive. They have a P-E ratio of 24.74 and a forward P-E ratio of just 17.87. These are very favorable numbers. And the PEG ratio is only 0.92. Definitely very good. The earning growth, comparing the first quarter of 2021 to the first quarter of 2020, is a whopping 165%. That's really awesome. Now, if you look at this chart here with the annual earnings, you might notice they had a loss of $5 billion in 2018. If you're wondering why did they drop the ball, the truth of the matter is that no, they did not drop the ball. They had a special write-off of $6 billion one-time charge for repatriation tax. That's because in 2018, the Trump administration changed the tax law to allow big companies like Qualcomm or Apple and Google to bring back the profits that they made in previous years that they kept overseas because these companies were trying to avoid taxes. Because the Trump administration gave them favorable tax treatments, that's why it was a good window of opportunity for companies like Qualcomm to bring back the money to the U.S. And because they brought back the money, they had to pay taxes, and that's why they had to write off $6 billion for the taxes that they were supposed to pay. It was already at a very reduced rate compared to the historical rates. So that's not from operation failures. They're just a tax maneuver. If you look at the earning forecast based on the Qualcomm management, they expect the second quarter sales to rise 46% year over year, and the earnings will increase 88% from the previous year ago period. And that's awesome. Just to go back to cover the $5 billion loss in 2018, here's an article published in September of 2018 saying that after Qualcomm brought back the money from overseas. They, of course, had the tax write-off. In the meanwhile, they spent $30 billion buying back stock. And as a result, the stock price has been going up. Let's look at my own valuation of the company. First of all, I start with 11 leading semiconductor companies. I take the average P-E ratio, which is 23.63. I assume an annual earnings growth of 24.5%. Actually, that's a very conservative estimate. And then I apply the actual financial figures for Qualcomm in 2020. Using these assumptions, I extrapolated into 2021, 2022, and 2023 for their stock prices and arrived at the conclusion of $160 to $180 share by the end of 2021. My actual calculation resulted in a stock price of 174 for 2021 and 216 for 22 and 2070 for 2023. That's why the 160 to 180 target is very conservative. In the next few weeks, when Qualcomm stock price starts to go up, I will most likely revise my target higher. Let's look at the other analysts' opinions. First of all, the closing prices of last Friday was 144.94. My own target is 160 to 180 by the end of 2021. Yahoo Business rates Qualcomm with a target price of 172. Louis Navalier gave Qualcomm an overall B rating, which is a buy rating. And Tip Ranks rate them as a moderate buy with a high target of 200, average 171, and low target of 150. CNN Money rates Qualcomm as a buy, high target of 200, median 175, and low 122. TheStreet.com rates them as a A-, minus, which is a buy rating, with a target of 189.98. These figures are pretty much in the same ballpark with my target, except my target might be a little bit lower 
than the average analyst estimates because I want to be conservative at this point considering the recent drop of 11-12% of the stock price. Here's some market psychology in play there. I want to wait until that bearish psychology is exhausted and see the price start turning up. Then I will revise my target upward accordingly. To truly understand Qualcomm, we need to really understand the patents and lawsuits they are involved in. And when we talk about patents and lawsuits, I need to introduce a term, which is friend. Not a friend as your next door neighbor, but friend as in fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. When an industry like the cell phone industry is trying to set up a new standard like the 4G standard or the 5G standard, they assemble a list of patents that are essential to implementing the standard. These are known as standards essential patents. And Qualcomm happens on many, many 4G and 5G patents. Now, the industry standard setting body then asked the patent holders like Qualcomm to promise to license those patents on a fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms to other cell phone makers. The patent holders usually agree to these terms because incorporating a patent into a standard enhances the company's value. Here's what things turn bad for Qualcomm. Several countries and companies accuse Qualcomm of not honoring its friend commitments. Friend patents are supposed to be available on the same term to everyone who wants to license them, either customers or even competitors. The plaintiffs, the people suing Qualcomm, allege that Qualcomm refused to license its standards essential patents to other chip makers. Also, there are other allegations alleged against Qualcomm, including that Qualcomm charged disproportionately high patent royalty rates to phone manufacturers and refused to sell them broadband chips if they did not license the patents. This is a policy referred to as no license, no chips. Under a typical contract with Qualcomm, a customer like Apple is given a discount on the loyalty paid to Qualcomm. But if the customer uses modems from another supplier instead of buying the modems from Qualcomm, the discount from Qualcomm for the patents is removed. Here's a list of some of the fines and lawsuits that Qualcomm has settled or still fighting in the last few years. On February of 2015, Qualcomm paid $975 million to China to settle a legal dispute. And then on December 2016, Qualcomm was fined $853 million by South Korea, and Qualcomm is still contesting the fine. In 2018, Qualcomm paid $93 million to Taiwan and pledged to invest $700 million in Taiwan over the next five years to settle a lawsuit there. In January 2018, EU fined Qualcomm $1.2 billion and then in July of 2019, EU fined Qualcomm another $272 million. Qualcomm is still contesting the fines. On April 2019, Qualcomm and Apple dropped all lawsuits against each other in a settlement. The fines that have not been settled are highlighted in yellow. Now, with regard to the EU fine, based on the most recent 10K report, Qualcomm has set aside $1.2 billion of reserve funds to cover the fine by EU. Of course, they haven't paid the fine yet because they are still fighting in court. But eventually, if they do have to pay the fine, it's not going to impact their income statement because they have already written off the expense related to that. Similarly, they have set aside money for the fine imposed by the South Korean government. They recently had a victory in the U.S. court with regard to this antitrust lawsuit and that was on August 11, 2020. So that's good news for Qualcomm, but I'm pretty sure that's not going to be the end of the lawsuits against Qualcomm. As we mentioned earlier, back in 2019, Apple and Qualcomm dropped all lawsuits against each other. Because of that settlement, Qualcomm will get at least $4.5 billion from Apple. And right after the settlement with Qualcomm, Apple acquired the majority of Intel's smartphone modem business. That was on July 2019. And then, as we mentioned earlier, back on December 10th of 2020, Apple announced that they would start working on its own cellular modem, but they didn't announce when they would have this modem available. It could be years. On January 10th, 2019, Qualcomm reached a very important patent-related agreement with Samsung and MediaTek. It's called a covenant to sue last. 
it's not a straight out chipset license. The way it is explained on this internet article is that it's a promise to sue someone only if all other alleged infringers have previously been sued. It's like saying, we very much do reserve the right to come after you, but we will deal with your competitors first. So that's basically the truth between Qualcomm and Samsung and MediaTek. That opened up Samsung and MediaTek to really start gaining significant market share in the cell phone area, which is in a way to alleviate Qualcomm of the burden of proving that they are not a monopoly. They might say that, hey, you know, look at Samsung, look at MediaTek, they have substantial market shares. How can you accuse us of being a monopoly? That's how I read this. I will talk more about this in the next few minutes. Now, if you look at the latest Qualcomm annual report, they report their revenues in two main segments. They had a QCT segment and a QTL segment. The QCT segment is the revenues from building products like chipsets for cell phones. And then the QTL segment is where they collect the royalties for their patents. As you can see for the latest quarter, the license revenues is 25% of QCT. It's substantial, more than $1.6 billion, but the product's revenue is even greater at $6.5 billion. And that's why I believe Qualcomm is not just sitting there and collecting revenues from their patents. They actually work hard to develop hardware and chipsets. Among the product revenues, the handsets are 65% of QCT. So they are very strong on handset processors. The other thing worthy of mention is the RF front end business, which has to do with designing and building, for example, switches for 5G network. I noticed that they had an impressive gain of more than 100% year to year. It's a good indication of the outstanding technology lead of Qualcomm in the industry. Now, if you look at the main hardware revenue source, which is the system on chips for cell phones, here's a comparison of one of the latest processors from Qualcomm, which is a Snapdragon 870, compared to the most advanced cell phone processor for Samsung, the Exynos 2100, and also compare with the most advanced chips from MediaTek, the Dimensity 1100 and Dimensity 1200. As you can see, the Qualcomm chip is pretty much neck and neck with the Samsung chip. With these numbers, the higher the better. Actually, Qualcomm performs better than the Samsung in the first three categories, but they are behind on AI performance. And for MediaTek, they don't even offer the AI performance. MediaTek, actually, they don't exactly compete in the same market segments. MediaTek only occupies a low to medium segments of the cell phone market, whereas Qualcomm is more in the medium and high end of the market. Same with Samsung. Samsung and Apple, they are at the high end of the market. Why is AI important on cell phone? Because AI can help with the camera operation. It helps with voice recognition, and it will also contribute to augmented reality. It will also help with day-to-day -day operations like managing battery life and security and also it provides facial recognition for security. And that's why to be a high-end cell phone, the processor needs to have AI capabilities like what's provided in the Qualcomm chips or Samsung chips or the latest Apple iPhone chips. How does the latest Qualcomm chip compare to the Apple iPhone? This is a comparison I found on the internet comparing the Snapdragon 870 chip from Qualcomm with the most advanced processor from Apple which is the A14 Bionic. Actually, the Snapdragon 870 is not exactly the most advanced chip from Qualcomm. The most advanced chip from Qualcomm is A80A. At this point, there's no cell phone in production which is using 888 yet, but I'm pretty sure by the end of the first quarter of 2021, we'll see two or three cell phones using the 888A chip. But let's just use the A70 information for now. Again, with these ratings, the higher the better. In these four different performance categories, as you can see, the Qualcomm chip is really behind Apple by about 5 to 10%. And by the way, the Qualcomm chip uses the 7 nanometer technology, whereas the Apple chip uses the 5 nanometer technology. Generally speaking, the smaller the dimension, the faster the processor, and also the less energy the processor will consume. And that's why 
the Apple chip is on a more advanced architecture. But how about the price? There's only one Snapdragon 870 cell phone in the market now, which is the Motorola Edge S launch in China in January of 2021. I'm pretty sure Motorola will introduce the same cell phone worldwide pretty soon. The Motorola cell phone with 128 gigabyte capacity is selling for the equivalent of 370 US dollars in China. The similarly equipped iPhone 12 is $879. It's more than double the price of the Motorola cell phone. But with a performance that's only 5 to 10 percent better, is it worth doubling the price? I guess some of the value shopper will probably feel that they would rather save more than 50, 60 percent of the cost and get a little bit less powerful cell phone. And that's why Qualcomm will continue to be a very formidable player in the cell phone market. And that's why I'm so bullish about a company. And then the next generation Snapdragon processor from Qualcomm, which is the 888 model. If you look at the comparison between the 888 and 870, the 888 is just about 5 to 10 percent better than the 870. That means when the cell phones with the 888 processors roll out into the market, they will be running neck and neck with the Apple 12 cell phones. There's another very interesting area in the cell phone market that I found out about, which is the gaming cell phones. Why is it important? Because the smartphone gaming revenue was estimated at over 63 billion US dollars in 2020, and it's a fast growing market. Based on this internet article, they picked top 10 mobile game performers. These are cell phones. For cell phones specifically designed with an emphasis on playing video games, the top five cell phones all use Qualcomm processors, either A65 Plus or A65, which is actually processors that are older than the A70 or A88 processors that we're talking about. But these are cell phones that have been selling in the market already. Among the non-gaming phones for gaming, out of the top five, three of them are supplied by Qualcomm. And we do see the iPhone 12 Pro and Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra among this list. What this is telling me is that Qualcomm has carved out a very significant niche in this gaming market. Let's list out the competitive advantages of Qualcomm after we've seen all these slides. First of all, they have many 5G license agreements, 120 of them, including multi-year patent license agreements with every major handset OEM. They will continue to collect the revenue, which amounts to about 20% of the total revenues. And they are very successful with the Snapdragon 800 series system on chip processors for cell phones. They still have the market leadership in 5G chipsets. They are very successful in the gaming cell phone market and they've been growing rapidly in the RF front end segment, like providing 5G switches. Their year to year growth for the last quarter has been more than 100%, which is very impressive. In the last two, three years, they've settled many major lawsuits against them, so the legal liability and potential dollar loss have been substantially reduced. And we see the continued increase in sales and earnings. They do have one weakness, and that is they are reliant on Samsung or Taiwan Semiconductor to build their processors. But Apple is also relying on either Samsung or TSM to build its processors. And that's why I don't think Qualcomm is any more disadvantaged than most of the other semiconductor companies. To sum it up, my target for Qualcomm at this point is set at a very conservative level of 160 to $180 a share by the end of 2021. Most likely in the next few weeks, I will revise this figure upward. And the current price is only 144.9, so there's a lot of room to go up. And the all-time high is 167.9. If you are watching this video a few days after February 21st, I'd like to remind you to check out the update section of this video below in case I have added updates to this video. I'd like to also remind you to please click the like, subscribe, and notification button if you like what you've seen so far. That way you will be notified when I post the next video on Qualcomm or on another stock.
As usual, I will very much appreciate your comments, suggestions, or questions. I'd like to mention that at this point, I will wait for more bullish technical confirmations before buying more shares of Qualcomm, especially if I can see that the price can get above that 145 resistance level in the next two, three days, then I will definitely buy more shares. I'm very bullish on Qualcomm at this point after I look into the company for the last three, four days. And I'm excited to share with you this information. When I make my trades of Qualcomm shares in the next few days, I will update in the note section below the video a few minutes I made the trades. At this point, I'd like to mention that I'm not a financial advisor. I provide my stock trading strategy for educational purpose only. You should make your own decision with regard to buying or selling financial instruments, and you should probably check with your financial advisors before you do so. This pretty much wraps up my video for now. I will chat with you again in the next few days. In the meanwhile, I'd like to wish you the very best with your financial investments.